Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church. It's an honor to gather around God's Word with you today. Every day where we uh, gather around God's Word is special, but uh, today is actually a, a special, extra special service because we're trying out our, our church body's new hymnal. They've given us uh, the rights to use one of its service settings for one day, just to, to try it out and, and see if we want to purchase it later when it, when it comes out later this year. So uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the service. A lot of the music will be new, so I encourage you to, uh, to follow along in your, your service folder. If you don't have a service folder, there's a little stack of them by the front. Uh, it'll be useful to, to follow along in there because it'll have the musical notation. And the songs will be new, so you can follow along with the notes to help you. Uh, what's on the screen won't have the musical notes, so it won't help you too much. If, uh, if the song is new and you don't feel comfortable singing, that's fine. You just, just listen to me um, and enjoy, enjoy the new music. And uh, lastly, our, our focus for worship today is how followers of Christ are servant leaders. God bless our worship, and uh, we begin with our first hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with 
my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the Lord have mercy today. I will sing the invitations to pray, and then you're invited to join in singing the, the Lord have mercies and the Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading appointed for use in Christian churches this Sunday comes from Numbers chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron learn the importance of humble leadership. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you that you not hold against us the sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 115. Why, the, why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. The Lord, Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. All you Israelites trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from James chapter 3. James teaches us that true wisdom shows itself in deeds of humility. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. 
such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. The, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we honor the words and the works of Jesus. For this gospel acclamation, I'll sing the refrain and I'll sing the verse, and then you're all invited to join me in the second refrain. chapter 9 and it will serve as the basis for the sermon. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please be seated.
greatest? Who do you think would be the, the greatest, the, the best leader for this country and for the city? It's election season right now in, in Calgary and for Canada, and you can't go one block down the street without seeing multiple politicians' faces staring back at you from, from all of their advertisements. There's even a, a massive advertisement for, for George right out in front of church, a little you know, uncomfortably close to our church's sign. It's, it's on public land, so I, I can't do anything about it. But, you know, these, these politicians, they're all trying to prove to us why they're the greatest leader, greatest person for the job, or at least while they're, uh, why they're the best of the options. In the gospel reading today, Jesus, he tells us what really makes a leader great. But he's not talking about the, the qualifications to lead a city or a country. He's talking about what makes a great Christian leader. And as we meditate on this section of scripture from Mark chapter 9 today, we'll see that a great and a godly leader is one who serves others in the context of Jesus' service for them. This is how to be a great leader. Understand how you've been served. Humbly serve others. Mark tells us today in the, the ninth chapter of his gospel that Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. So they were, they were traveling to Jerusalem, and along the way, Jesus was teaching his disciples about leadership. And that was important because these men, these closest disciples of his, would soon become the leaders of God's people on earth. We call them the apostles. And the most important thing they needed to understand in order to be leaders later on was what Jesus was about to do in Jerusalem when they got there. Jesus told them, he's speaking about himself here, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But the disciples did not understand what Jesus meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. I think we can get why they didn't want to ask him more about this. I mean, Jesus was talking about people killing him. It's not exactly a fun topic of conversation, but it was important that they understood this. Because Jesus going to Jerusalem and letting himself be killed there would be the greatest act of leadership that the world has ever seen. Jesus being killed on a cross is how he would lead the way to heaven for us. It's the ultimate example of servant leadership because as he was dying, he was serving us in our greatest need. And our greatest need is forgiveness for our sin. Because, of, because we have all disobeyed God, because we have all sinned, we deserve our holy God's punishment. But Jesus, as he was being killed, he served us by taking the punishment of God we deserved upon himself and suffering for it. He put the needs of the whole world ahead of his own, and he made the hardest sacrifice imaginable. God sent his son Jesus here to this earth to be our leader and our Lord, but according to Jesus' own word, he did not come here to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what great leadership looks like, serving others by sacrificing yourself. 
Now, Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that this, this is the main way he was serving them. They didn't get it at first, but, but later on when they witnessed Jesus willingly be betrayed and delivered into the hands of men and killed for their forgiveness, they began to understand, they began to believe. If you and I want to be great leaders in God's eyes, then we must serve others. But first, before we serve anyone, we must understand how Jesus has served us. Because that's, that's, that's where our inspiration to serve and lead comes from. the depth of, of sacrifice and sorrow that Jesus went through to save us from hell. It is so profound. There's no amount of learning and studying we can do where we can get to a point and say, I fully understand what Jesus did for me. Our whole lives need to be growing in our faith and growing in our understanding of what Jesus did because it means everything to us. Understanding how Jesus saved us and served us, it changes everything. It, it gives us peace. It gives us contentment. It makes us thankful and willing to serve others as we have been served. It gives us purpose. Because the ultimate purpose of a godly leader is to spread the good news of Jesus with the world. A good leader can do a lot of things, but, but I'll say it again, the ultimate purpose of a good leader is to lead others to Jesus. Because that is, Jesus has the most important thing for every person. He serves everyone in their greatest need by giving them forgiveness. And a godly leader brings people to Jesus. As we talk about uh, what makes a leader great, it's natural to, to think, well, then, who is the greatest? But great leadership is, is not about being the greatest or comparing yourself with other people to see who is better. It's about humble service. And that's what Jesus taught his disciples next. Mark tells us that they they finished at least one leg of their journey and they came to Capernaum. And when Jesus was in one of the houses, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. The disciples were, they were excited about being trained to be leaders, but they still lacked the, the humble servant heart that's necessary for leadership. And they even knew that their, their prideful attitude was a problem. Because when Jesus asked them about it, they, they didn't answer. It's kind of like us, when we know about our problems, we don't want to talk about them. We don't want to talk about them with people who could help us. But Jesus knew they needed to talk about this, or else they, they wouldn't become the, the leaders he needed them to be. So he brought it up, and he taught them some humility. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Once again here, Jesus emphasizes that leadership is servanthood. It's so different from what much of the rest of the world thinks about leadership. That leadership is not so much about you know, telling other people what they should do. It's, it's more about serving others in their needs. But what Jesus adds to the whole leadership discussion here is that if you want to be a great leader, if you want to be first, then we have to be last. What does Jesus mean that we should be last? 
Well, if you're last, you don't receive recognition or reward. You know how this is in a, in a competition. It's the first and the second and the third place people who get the recognition. But if you're last, you don't get it. So Jesus says, serve others like you're last. Serve others and do good for them. Simply because that's what our Savior wants us to do. Not because we're looking for the praise or the thanks or the recognition or even payment for it. And certainly not because we want to make ourselves feel better. We serve others because that's what Jesus wants us to do and he has served us so well. And Jesus gave them an example of this. He took a little child whom he placed among them Taking the child in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And not only just him, but the one who sent him, the Father. Jesus picked up this little child. So it must have been a pretty small one, a baby or a toddler. A baby is a perfect example of someone we care for and serve we do many, many things for, but really can't do that much for us, except for looking cute. <laughs> we have to do everything for them, and we get little in return. That's what true servant leadership looks like. Putting ourselves last, putting the needs of others before our own, and not receiving payment for it. There's a lot of ways we can apply this to our lives, but I think the most direct application is the most meaningful, especially for those of us who have a baby or a small child in the family. I mean, think about this. It, what this means is that caring for babies and little children is one of the greatest acts of leadership you could do. This is you know, so powerful. If you're a, a parent or a grandparent, or an older brother or sister, and you have a little, little one in the family, all the hours, the thousands of hours you put into serving kids every year, the changing them and the teaching them and the strapping them in the car and the taking them to church and the welcoming them in Jesus' name, all that time is not wasted. God so very much values your time taking care of little children. It's one of the greatest things you could do, even though the world doesn't recognize you for it. And at times it's exhausting and tedious. That is a beautiful thing to do in the eyes of God. What are some other ways that we can humbly serve What about when there's a, a family member or a friend or even a neighbor, someone who's in a bad place? They're going through a really hard time and look, you know, if you're honest with yourself, you really don't enjoy spending time with them. They're not very fun to be around, but, but they need you. They need someone to, to listen to them or be with them or encourage them. We will be those people who serve others to put the needs of them ahead of our own. Other examples are people with no homes, people with no food on the table, or, or refugees who are fleeing from persecution or war. We need to serve them too. Service that is great in the eyes of God is is giving others their best when they're at their worst. It's, it's loving people when they don't deserve it. It's praying for your enemies, that, that good happens to them. That's what Christian leadership looks like. Humble service to others when we expect little or nothing in return. That's what we do. And as we think about all these ways that we, we can 
humbly serve, but it can be exhausting because there's so many people who need our help. It can be overwhelming. Working together as a Christian community of people, we can do this. We will be because the love of Jesus compels us to, it inspires us because we understand all these ways that other people need our service. That's all how Jesus has served us. When we were at our worst, when we were still sinners, the Apostle Paul says, Christ died for us. He helped us for free. He gave us forgiveness and peace and purpose in this life for free. He was killed as a sacrifice of atonement for the whole world, even though so many people would never believe in him or recognize him or give him thanks. He prayed for his enemies and for all people, even the people who were killing him on the cross. He shows us love even when we don't deserve it. And when we were homeless, when we had no place or right to be in heaven, Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is there right now, preparing a place for us. Understanding this and serving like this is what makes a great leader. So who is the greatest? As we see all the election signs this month, use them as a reminder to think about what Jesus teaches about leadership. And if you vote, vote for the person you believe will be the best public servant. But, you know, most important of all, no matter who gets elected, pray that God give you the strength and the courage to be a leader, to stand up and lead in your home, with your family, in your community, and in your church. <coughs> Serve as Jesus has served you. That's our Christian duty. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please stand as we confess our faith in the words of the, of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For the prayer of the church today, we will do this responsibly. Eternal Lord, Give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you've laid out for us. 
work in us so that we believe and live the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as we proclaim your grace to us in all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever we serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect to those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and comes to trust in you. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. And especially today, we ask that you pour your special blessing on Rebecca Bookie, who is sick at home, and our brother Daniel Kachuk, who lost one of his family members over in Ethiopia. Also give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and the dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to your love in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken in silence, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. As we begin the portion of the service with the sacrament, in this part in particular, we will sing it responsibly. It is new music, so I encourage you to follow along in your service folder. The, the musical notes are there. Um, if you don't know what to sing, then you can just, just listen to me. good 
and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise the holy name and join their glorious song. thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from his curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life to he conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood, and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks and worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, and our Lord, and our Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. To the Lamb of God, I will sing the first phrase, and then you're invited to join me in singing the second two phrases.
Please be seated and move forward at the direction of the mayor. Body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of all our sins. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of all our sins. Take and eat this true body of Christ. Now this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. 
This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Now may this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace, Pastor. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy and he endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give you thanks, O Lord the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day, when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord give you his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you all for coming today, uh, worshiping God with us and trying out uh, the new hymnal. What you experienced today is, is one of the many, probably one of seven different musical settings for the liturgy that we could use. Uh, this is just a sampling of, of what we will have at our fingertips um, if we choose to purchase this symbol uh, at the end of the year. If you have questions about it, feel free to ask, ask me. Um, and just in a few moments, we'll have a 19-minute Bible study right after, right after the service. We'll do it like we used to do it. Um, in here. Uh, unfortunately, with, with the new restrictions, we have to socially distance. And we can't really meet in the other room anymore unless we would be really spread out. So we're going to do Bible study how we, how we used to do it, all in here right after the service. Um, and we'll, we're going to study some of the scripture, some of the Bible that is in the way that we worship. Uh, so some of the things that you heard and, and sung today uh, we're going to look into the, the biblical basis for worshiping like that. Um, I know last week when we were talking about dual citizenship and, and can a pastor talk politics, uh, there was still some more we could have talked about. Um, I think we might have to table that for another time when we can actually have discussions uh, more easily amongst each other when we can get a little bit closer to each other and actually talk you know, between families. So we'll, we'll save that for a, for a different time. As for another announcements, um, I will be on holiday for the next uh, week and a half or so. So if, if you need, uh, if, if there's an emergency and you need pastoral assistance, um, you can call Pastor Schultz or email him. He's on the, the other side of Calgary. So I'll, I'm gonna be sending an email out uh, today or tomorrow with all of that information. Uh, when I will be back, and then if you need pass, if you need a pastor in the meantime, I'll give you Pastor Schultz's information so you can contact him. Uh, this week's cleaners are the, the Lakings, and I want to thank um, Lindsay for cleaning the church yesterday, and everyone, uh, Byron especially, for helping out with the clicker and uh, with live streaming. By the way, thank you for anybody who's still with us online. Thanks for joining us through uh, Facebook. Lastly here, um, one more, I want to pitch this, this Bible study. Uh, it will be a strict 19 minutes. Uh, and if you stay, it, this will enrich your worship and make worship more meaningful to you from every Sunday from now on. I'm serious. We're going to talk about why the way we worship the way we do. It will give more meaning to every single Sunday. 
So that's, that, that's part of the importance of the Bible study we're doing today. Byron, could you uh, pass up the clicker, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll keep this live. God's word and the way we worship. I'm going to set my uh, set my timer because it will be it will be a strict 19 minutes. <clears throat> So what I what I plan to do for this, this short period is just go back into the service that we just you know we just did and look at some of the things that we sang and some of the things that we said and we'll, we're going to find that Christians have been worshiping like this for over a thousand years and there's a reason for that. So for example, um, in the beginning of the service we have what we call the, the Lord have mercy. Its traditional name is the, the Kyrie, which is the Greek word for Lord. So Kyrie eleison is, is Lord have mercy in Greek. And so uh, Christians have been, uh, they've had this as a portion of their worship service since the fourth century AD. So that's, that's for 1600 years, Christians have had this in their, as a part of their worship service. As you can see, the Lord of mercy is uh, it's basically asking the Lord in prayer for mercy and we do it we do it multiple times in peace let's pray to the lord lord of mercy for peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the lord lord of mercy that way that kind of gets bigger right we pray for for peace in the whole world for the well-being of, of the church and for the unity of everyone we are praying and asking god to have mercy now lord have mercy is, is a prayer that believers have prayed um, since before Jesus came. It's, it's found in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. Uh, I have some Psalms here listed for us. Psalm 25, 11, deliver me and be merciful to me. Psalm 41, so I have mercy on me, Lord, heal me, for I have sinned against you. Psalm 123, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. It's also a prayer we see that believers use in the New Testament. With Matthew 9, Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. In Matthew 15, there's a, there's a Canaanite woman crying to Jesus, Have mercy on me, because her daughter was possessed by a demon. My question for you is, you know, what, are, what are two reasons it's good to ask God for mercy at the beginning of a worship service, because that's where we have the Lord of mercy. It's, it's right away in the beginning of worship. What are two reasons why it's, it's good to do that? I'll let you talk about that amongst yourselves uh, for 30, 40 seconds. Thanks for the uh, thanks for your patience in this new method of Bible study. Um, we all enjoyed being over there with our copies. <sighs> uh, pray that we can be back there soon. But thanks for thanks for uh, bearing with bearing with the, this whole situation here. Uh, what are, what are what are reasons that you thought of? What's, why is it good to ask for mercy in, in the beginning of the service? What do you think? Yeah, you'd say it helps you get in the right mindset, mm -hmm. the right, uh, the right, start getting the right attitude for for worship. Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's an excellent reason. Well, for me, I think we ask for that because uh, uh, we are sinners, so it's for come we ask for that. We ask for, we ask for, we ask for, we ask for that. 
Yeah, so we, we are sinners and we, we don't deserve blessings from God. So we have to ask him for mercy. If we want good things from God, then we need his mercy. That's, that's what mercy is. Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. We are, we are very happy that we do not get what we deserve from God. We get mercy because he chooses to not punish us, but rather be, uh, be merciful to us in Jesus. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, you bring up a good point that we have, we need mercy, um, specifically because we're sinners, but also for other reasons too. If you look at you know some of the some of the context for where people have asked for mercy from God in the past, it's because they've endured no end of contempt, um, sin, like you mentioned um, here in Matthew nine. It's because these these two men were blind, they had physical disabilities. And then the last one here, there was a, there was a demon possession. So, the reason, another reason we ask for mercy, not only because we need forgiveness for sin, but also because we have so many things uh, hurting us and troubling us in life. Whether it's it's some a problem with our bodies or um, a problem like relationship problems or other things, we have so many things where we need help from God. So, we ask him for mercy. The next part of the service, if you'll, if you remember, this the, the glory to God of the highest, otherwise known in, in Latin as the glory, that happens immediately after the Lord had mercy. You go, go right into it. The lyrics for this song, they go, uh, glory to God of the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we praise you, we give you thanks. And we, we, and we praise Jesus, um, only Son of the Father, Lord and Lamb, to take away the sin of the world. And we acknowledge that He is right now in heaven at the right hand of God, in power, ruling over all things for our good. Christians have had this as a, a portion of their worship service since uh, since the second century, so really, really far back. That's that's getting close to when Jesus was walking on the earth. The uh, where the glory to God in the highest, where that where this song the Christians sing, where it came from, is from these words of the angels in in Luke chapter two. So this was the the first Christmas. This is the birth of Jesus. Luke tells us there were shepherds living in the fields, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The angel said, "Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will, that will cause great joy for all the people." Today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So Christians took this song and started to sing it. Now, my question for you is, you know, why do you think, why do you think you sing the Gloria immediately after the Lord had mercy? Why don't you think about that for uh, 20, 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> why is it meaningful to you that we sing it right after? Or, or why do you think the Christians 1,800 years ago decided to put it where they put it? It's good to give thanks to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
What other thoughts do you have? Why, oh yeah, what do you think where? mentioned that we, we, we praise and we thank God for giving us forgiveness because we need it so bad. Yeah, and that's that's a part of the connection. This is why we, we have the Gloria right after the, the Lord of Mercy. So the, the, the Gloria is the it is the answer. Like we ask God for mercy. And he answers with sending us Jesus. This is the song that was sung the day Jesus came. This is the song we sung the day Jesus was born. And the angels were singing, God has answered your prayer for mercy. Here is the Savior, Jesus, this little baby. So Christians, have, they, this is a song of praise and thanks. That God has answered us when we ask him for mercy and for help. If we could sum it up here, the, the, the glory of here is, is the song that the angels sang to the Bethlehem shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth. It is God's answer to us asking the Lord to have mercy. God gives us peace and goodwill through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, all of our blessings, not just forgiveness, they come from Jesus. So Jesus is the answer um, to mercy. That's how God has mercy on us. Now, in the, the second part of the service, as we're as we're nearing getting you know, getting closer to uh, enjoying the sacrament, <clears throat> we sing the the song "Holy, Holy, Holy." Now, the, the, the ancient word they used for that is the the sanctus. Uh, this is also really really old. In fact, uh, this is known as the most ancient and most celebrated and most universal of all Christian hymns. This is the if, if any, if no Christian hymn has been sung more than this, because it's sung every week that you have Holy Communion, right before the sacrament. Um, holy, 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 God of power, God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, before I go to the next slide and show you where in the Bible this comes from, I'll give you a hint. The, the, the lyrics for this song come from two separate parts of the Bible. The, does anybody know where? Was that? Yeah. So, um, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's what that's what everyone's saying as Jesus rode into Jerusalem the week of his death. Yeah, when he rode in as king. What's the other part from? Does anybody know? Close, close. It is in the Old Testament, but not the Psalms. It is from Isaiah, Isaiah 6, where he gets this vision of the angels in heaven singing the praises of God. And the angels were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So we combine these two. Uh, together to come up with a song, the Sanctus. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, because we're nearing, we have about five minutes left. I, I want to get through this. What is the beauty of adding these two songs together? The beauty of it is, uh, we are, we, by combining these two songs together, one sung by angels in heaven, and the other sung by the people on earth, we combine the praise of heaven and earth into one. The whole creation praising God, and specifically the Messiah, Jesus, who has come in the name of the Lord to save us. So we, you know, this is the song, this is why it's so beautiful, Christians have sung it for so long, is because it, it's like the, the, it's the mother of all hymns. It is the song of the angels and the song of the people all praising God together. Also, it's, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
heaven and earth, all praising God. And lastly here, uh, we sing the Lamb of God right before we receive the sacrament. <clears throat> Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Again, we, we say have mercy on us. There's a, a number of places this comes from. Um, Isaiah 53, the great prophecy of how Jesus would save us. Uh, talks about Jesus being led like a lamb to the slaughter. John 1, which is the, the primary place where we get this song from, is, is the words of John the Baptist, who, who saw Jesus in the distance and said, he pointed, he's like, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then 1 Peter 1, um, I'll read this whole one. So you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. My question is, what are, uh, what are two things, two reasons you think of that the singing the Lamb of God here is helpful before receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion? Why is this a useful thing to sing? What do you think? Yeah. So yeah, so we can recognize some of the meaning in the sacrament. Specifically, what? The shadows in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus and what he would do. Specifically, all the, the, the many hundreds of thousands of lambs that were slaughtered and sacrificed to remind people that there would be another lamb. This one, the Son of God, who would, by his sacrifice, take away the sins of the world. Another one. Um, it's like similar to the whole idea of the Son of The angels in heaven are also singing about the Lamb, about Jesus. Yeah, and we know that because of the, uh, Jesus isn't really mentioned by name in Revelation. You got to you got to know uh, by the descriptions and the visions uh, when it's Jesus. But Jesus is called, I think, more than in more than twenty times in the Book of Revelation. He is referred to as the Lamb. So we sing about Jesus, the Lamb. Any other thoughts about? Yeah, the other thing is, uh, I want to point this out, when, they, when in the Old Testament, when they celebrated the Passover, when they, when they slaughtered a lamb, they would take the lamb's blood and then paint it on their door frames. Uh, they, 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 they do, it was, a, it was symbolic of, of the blood saving them, the blood of the lamb saving them. The same thing with, with the blood that we receive in the sacrament, the blood of Jesus is, was used to purchase our souls. And to forgive our sin. So yeah, it's a it's a whole lot of uh, of imagery and, and symbolism and and meaning in uh, singing about Jesus, the Lamb of God. So that that's uh, actually we got a minute left. So um, I want to I want to close with just uh, you know one thing in particular here. So Christians have been using these songs for. All of these songs, they're, they're at least 1,300 years old. Some of them are 1,800 years old. And they've been used for almost yeah, the last two millennia. They've been used with different tunes, you know, different melodies. So uh, that's why you're probably familiar with the, the stuff that we sang today. The words that we sang, you're familiar with. Because those words have stayed the same. The songs have stayed the same for, uh, for over a 1,000 years. The, the tunes, the melodies that we sing them to, those have changed over time. And so that's what the new hymnal has done. 
new hymnal has put some new melodies to the same words uh, to keep things fresh. And if we get a new hymnal, there's, there's various options. So we heard just one of the melodies we could sing these two today, but there will be other options. There's even that I'm especially excited about. I think there's a, an African themed uh, a liturgy that was, to, or melodies that were developed in Africa to sing these, these songs to. And since we have more than half of our membership here is from Africa, um, that might be especially useful for us. So I'm really excited about the, about the new hymnal um, and what, will, what it will allow us to do for, for worship. And again, if you have any questions about it, uh, please yeah, just let me know. I'll be happy to explain more. Thanks for coming and uh, sticking around. God bless the rest of your week.